merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.
that I think he had real life stories in. That you were the word for all of them. That you're the one who rescues. I thank you that we can come here in this place. And even if it's uncomfortable, we can be honest. Even if we don't want to, we can be honest with you and transparent. You're the word for all. So that you know that you're the one who rescues us. You know our hearts. You know what we need. I pray that you would move in this place and that we would let you move in this place, even in the places where we want to protect ourselves. Let us be real with you and move here in ways that only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanted to say thank you to the worship team for super songs this morning that we sang, and thanks to Mike for our prayer, and thanks to for Derek as he shared with us about uh, the upcoming elder uh, situation. So I hope you'll be in prize of that, and I also want to thank our purple-haired lady. I think she did a good job. I just kind of wondered if I couldn't have the bubbles on me and keep me cooler, and I've never preached in bubbles before, so... But anyway, I wanted to say this. Next Sunday is the Sunday before I take vacation or go on vacation with my wife. She's a school teacher and intervention specialist. We don't get a lot of time to spend together during a normal year. And so we normally take the month of July and just get away for her sake particularly. And we spend time together. But next Sunday, I would like to invite any of you who have a Hawaiian-type shirt or ladies' Hawaiian-type blouse or dress or whatever it is to come and look kind of vacation-y next Sunday because I'm going to come with my special Hawaiian Sunday shirt that I wear the Sunday before I go on vacation. So I just give you that invitation. I don't think you'll need a reminder. I, I remember one time talking with a, saying that and, uh, in, a, in a church and uh, I was at a men's breakfast just before that Sunday, and one dear brother, older brother said to me, he said, Walt, he said, I've got one of those shirts, but I don't think I'm going to wear it tomorrow. And I, I called him by name, and I said, well, why not? And he said, well, I just don't want to call too much attention to myself. <laughs> well, as we get started this morning, there was a dad who came home, and he had a, a terrible day, and he wasn't in a good mood, and his son came to him, and he said, Dad, how much money do you make an hour? And his dad said, well, you don't need to know that. That's not important to you. You, you don't need to know that. And he said, Dad, I, I want to know how much money you, you make an hour. And his dad put him off and got angry, and he said, just go to your room. I don't want to talk to you. So he sent him off to his room. The dad got to thinking about that and said, well, maybe he really had a need for $10. And he, uh, so uh, he went to his room and the dad had said, well, I make 20 bucks an hour. And so the son said, I, I, uh, I, I wanted $10. So the dad went to his room and the, the son was there and the dad said, son, I'm really sorry. I didn't know whether maybe you really had a need and I was not had a good day and I was angry and and I'm really sorry. And uh, he said, well, what did you want the $10 for? And the, the son was sitting on his bed, and he pulled out from underneath his pillow a crumpled up number of dollar bills. And uh, he said, Dad, you said you made $20 an hour. I've got 10 $1 bills I've been holding on crumpled up under my bed, and with the $10 you give me, can I buy an hour of your time? Did you catch that? Interesting, isn't it? This morning we want to talk about in whose image, in whose likeness. Today we celebrate Father's Day. I believe that to celebrate Father's Day is a very noteworthy day in the life of the church since God the Father created the first father, Adam, 
And from him all persons and races were begotten. Think of it. Each of us would not be here without that first God-created dad. If all in God's created order would have remained as God desired, we would still be in God's paradise created for sinless human beings. But such is not the case. The first human father did not remain in the created order as God desired, for he, along with his wife, chose a different path for their offspring. And from Genesis 3 on, as Paul Harvey For those who are familiar with the name and the broadcast would say, from Genesis 3 on is the rest of the story. And we see this fact in our text from Genesis 5. If you've got your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them because I want you to know where passages are in your own scriptures, but I have done some highlighting and so I will read it from the, uh, the board. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, he created him in the likeness of God. Notice that is underlined. He created them male and female and blessed them and he named them man in the day that they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image named him Seth. Then the days of Adam, then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. I first would like you to notice the underlying portions that you can see behind me. God made Adam and Eve in his image. But then we move to verse 3 and we recognize that when Adam procreated his third son, or his sons, we should say, you'll see that in a minute, but when Adam procreated his third son, Moses records that now, and remember we are post Genesis 3. And I say that because I have recognized if we did not have a Bible and we did not understand what happened in Genesis 3, the whole rest of the Bible would not make a lot of sense. And so Adam did not create Seth in God's image like God had created Adam and Eve in his image. He created Seth in his own image. It's interesting that Adam and Eve were made in God's likeness. And next, of course, Moses records that Adam had a son. And please note that Adam's third son was, as I said, not in God's likeness, but in Adam's own likeness, according to Adam's image. Ponder this change. From Adam being created in God's image to Adam created a child in his own image and not in God's image. If Adam were originally created in the image and likeness of God, why this change? Why was Adam not able to pass on God's image through procreation. Clark's commentary answers this question very well. The soul of Adam was created in the, in the moral image of God, in knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. In Genesis 3, he had now sinned and consequently had lost his moral resemblance to his maker. He had also become mortal through the breach of the law. His image and likeness were therefore widely different at that time from what they were before. And his begotting children, 
in his, in this image and likeness plainly implies that they were imperfect like himself, moral like himself, sinful and corrupt like himself, for it is impossible that he, being impure, fallen from the divine nature, could begat a pure and holy offspring. Do you think that Adam had purposely desired to create, imi- uh, create children in his own image? I pray not. Yet Adam, choosing to respect and disobey God's command in the Garden of Eden, brought sin into his life, into his family, and the world at large. Seth was Adam's third son made in his image. Due to Adam's fallen nature and likeness being passed on from Adam to his children, Cain, Adam's first son, chose not to manage his anger well and in jealousy killed his brother Abel, Adam's second son. Both nature and nurture are a part of this passage. Thus, not only is Seth a substitute for Adam's first sons, the best Adam can do now through procreation is to, pro- is to produce another offspring in his own likeness, in his own image. If given the choice, whose likeness would you seek to pass on to your children? God's loving, righteous, holy, perfect likeness? Or your own fallen, imperfect, and corrupt likeness? Ponder that a minute. If given a choice, which one of those would you choose to pass on? The passing of the fallen nature onto a child or children is not necessarily a purpose choice. It may be an inadvertent action. As I grew up, I began to recognize there was something going on in my life. I, for a period of years, had become a contractor, and I built several outbuildings to store things that I had collected. In fact, I never wanted anybody to come over to my place because I was afraid that if they saw something I had that they could use, I would have to give it to them. And I struggled with that for quite a while. And I, I would pray about it. I went to the altar several times. I had some colleagues gather around me and and I asked them to help me and pray for with me about this struggle I had with coveting and hoarding. And while it was short-lived effective. I still knew there was something going on in my heart. One day, after my father had passed away, probably several years or more after that, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something that took place when I was about seven or eight. My dad had said to me, Walter, would you you help me with something? If you would, I'll give you a dollar. And I... You know, back then, 1959 or 60, a dollar was a dollar. Maybe like a dime is today, I don't know. Or maybe like $10 is today, that's the other way around. And so I helped Dad, and, I, and, the, and the picture the Holy Spirit took me to was Dad and I were standing by his bureau, and he always had money on the top of his bureau. And of course, I'm not too tall anyway, and then I was a lot shorter then, and I was kind of looking up at the bureau. And uh, and he grabbed a dollar off of it, and he handed it to me. 
And as I put my fingers around it to receive it, he said to me, Walter, you realize our family has, has had deep financial struggle. Would you mind if I took that dollar bill back? And I never saw that dollar bill again. And I realized at that moment, my struggle with coveting and hoarding was linked to that event in my life. I didn't want to let go of stuff that I couldn't get back. And I bowed my head, and as best I could, with some some tears, I asked God to help me forgive my dad for never giving me the dollar back. And I gained some freedom. Now I would love for you to come to my house. You could go through my two outbuildings. If there's anything there you need except for my Kubota BX25, you can have it. My wife would love it. But you see, there are some things that the fallen nature passes on inadvertently and finds other venues in children's lives that if we are not careful, dads, we can set up things for them to struggle with years after they had died. I lost my dad when I was 27, and I think I was probably in my late 30s at that time. Another story that I would share with you is in Jesus that in reference to your former manner of life, the old nature, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in in righteousness and holiness of truth. As we conclude, grant grant me a little license. While this passage, or this message, while this message has had a dad theme, it also tells the story about the source of the challenges which we as a congregation face. And unless we face, unless we work together in forgiveness and through redemption and reconciliation at overcoming the systemic fallen nature attributes of our history and present, the family of God will either suffer, maybe defeat, or be victorious, as is true of the human family. If given a choice, whether we're talking about individual parents, dads, as the theme of this message has been, or about congregations, whose likeness would you seek to pass on to your children or on to your church? God's loving, righteous, holy, perfect likeness or your own fallen imperfect and corrupt likeness. If I were to quote James, he would say, but whence come wars and fightings among you, whether it be in family or church? Is it not, I would parenthetically say, that we have not done well against the battle in Jesus against our fallen nature? And so, if given a choice, one question remains. I hope you make the right choice. Our families and our church and our nation depend on that choice. As the worship team comes, I would ask you to simply bow your head as I lead us in a short pastoral sermon concluding prayer. You bow your heads with me.
Maybe you want to take this moment, whether dad or mom or child, we all are one of those categories. And allow the Holy Spirit for just a moment to speak to you and show you in your heart, if you are willing, that place or those places where you have not done well in battling your own carnal nature, the fallen nature, through the new nature of Jesus. And you've been a part of maybe harming your family or harming yourself or, in a congregational sense, harming your church. And if you would let the Holy Spirit in, something new and vibrant is about to happen. And if you can simply allow the Holy Spirit in to bear witness with your spirit that you are the child of God, something wonderful can happen. So I invite you to face your maker with that question, whose image do you want to bear as you move forward? And if you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior, I ask you, I plead with you, for the sake of yourself and your family and your church, and if you are obstinate, would you confess that so that everybody's life would be a lot more joyous? Heavenly Father, we are yours. We have always been yours, but we've always not acknowledged that we want you to be ours. And in these moments, Lord, we have some great dads in our congregation, and I ask that you would touch them deeply. They have an awesome responsibility. Sometimes we don't do it well. And I, as a dad, ask with these dads that you would forgive us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want better for ourselves, for our families, and for our church. So will you simply with this opportunity that you have with us, draw us closer to yourself? Will you bring healing to our lives, and will you help us get back the ground that we have yielded to the fallen nature and thus to Satan? For your glory, I pray. Amen.
worship team was singing, I was reminded of something, a statistic that I saw some years ago. And it was about Father, Mother's Day cards and Father's Day cards. Whoops. And it was very interesting that a gal had been doing ministry in prisons, in a woman's prison, and many of those people wanted Mother's Day cards. And she couldn't get enough of them to pass out in the prisons for the, those there to send to their mothers. And she says, oh, I'm going to need about the same number for Father's Day. And she only had four or five taken out of the prison for Father's Day cards. As I thought about that and I think about our sermon text this morning and responses and I'm recognizing that maybe the biggest struggle in our society is not political, but it's personal. It has to do with dads standing up for core values, Christian dads, and being the model of Jesus that we all as dads struggle with. Here's our concluding. How blessed is the man who does not walk or I'm sorry, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his the law is in the light of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatsoever he does, he prospers. Heavenly Father, through the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will you make us such people or continue to build us to be such people, desiring in us the divine nature of Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. Go in peace.